All right. So we want to write an objective function, which is basically going to describe a quantity that needs to be maximized or minimized. Then we want to use inequalities to describe the limitations on the situation. And then lastly, we want to use linear programming to solve the situation. Okay. So like I said, linear programming is just a method for solving problems where a particular quantity needs to be maximized or minimized. Now the objective function is the algebraic expression of two variables uh, describing a quantity that needs to be maximized or minimized. A prime example that I always use is area, because area is length times width. And a lot of times we want to maximize an area. Say we've got a specific amount of fencing and we want to arrange that fencing in a square or a rectangle such that we maximize the amount of grass that is enclosed. We can use linear programming to do that. Okay. Two variables, one function. Okay, That's going to be the objective function. It's what we are minimizing or maximizing. So we want to write an objective function. We're going to take this problem and we're going to step by step it all the way through linear programming. So a company manufactures bookshelves and desks for computers. X is going to represent the number of bookshelves that they make uh, per day and Y is going to be the number of desks they make per day. Now they sell the bookshelves for $25. They sell the desks for uh, $55. Well, they make profit, I should say. They don't sell it for that. That's, what they, that's the profit they make. $25 per bookshelf, $55 per desk. We want to write the objective function modeling total daily profit. Okay, so if Z is the total profit, what's the objective function going to be? How do I write the amount of profit? If X is how many bookshelves we make and Y is how many desks we make. Right. We're going to multiply 25 times however many bookshelves we make. We're going to multiply 55 times however many desks we make. And we're going to add them together. Now, if I were to ask you to maximize this, you really couldn't. There's no constraints. If I said, well, what's the most money they can make? Well, yeah. Well, first off, quit making bookshelves. Right, because they don't make as much money on them. Just make desks and make a zillion of them, and you've maximized your money, right? Well, no, because you can make a zillion in one and make a little more money, right? So you have to have constraints. You've got to have things that are keeping you in check, okay? Otherwise, it's just, you know, crazy, crazy. There he is. And there she is. The two people I was wondering where were, okay. Life is better now. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's look at some constraints. Our constraints are generally going to be expressed as inequalities. Like, say, two, two right off the bat, you can automatically assume x and y are both greater than zero. Right? You're not going to make a negative amount of disks. You're not going to make a negative amount of bookcases, right? So automatically, you know you've got constraints of x greater than 0, y greater than 0, or equal to. I guess in theory, they could be. You could make none. You're not going to make any money, but you could. Okay? So these are going to be two constraints that almost always show up. But all this does is restrict our graph to the first quadrant, right? It just, just guarantees that we're going to be positive. So if we're looking at here, we know that it's greater than 0. So these are the lines, x equals 0 and y equals 0. This goes in this direction. This goes in this direction. What has both of them? Just quadrant 1, right? So automatically, we know we're going to be in quadrant 1. Now. What if we add the constraint that the company shouldn't manufacture more than a total of 80 pieces per day? How am I going to write that as a constraint? It, 
How do you write x plus y does not exceed 80? x plus y is less than or equal to 80. Right? And that means that the total of all the bookcases and desks will not be greater than 80. It can be 80, but no more than 80. That's where the equal to comes in. That, that's, that's important. Okay? Now, what if I tell you that to meet customer demand, the company has to manufacture between 30 and 80 bookshelves per day, inclusive? How would I represent that as a constraint? Say that again. Now be careful. This is strictly bookshelves. Well, then tell me what it is. I know what it is, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to think about it. <laughs> so x has to be between 30 and 80, right? So we just write this as a compound inequality. x has to be between 30 and 80. You can write it as x greater than or equal to 30, x less than or equal to 80. X is bookshelves, right? So you can write it either way. Since it's constraints, it's, it's and, so you can write it as a compound. All right, what about because of customer demand, they have to manufacture at least 10, but no more than 30 desks per day. So what is this going to look like? Yes, 10 less than or equal to y, less than or equal to 30. Y has to be between 10 and 30. Okay? It's making sense. Am I losing anybody? Okay? Now, to solve a linear programming problem, We've got the objective function. Furthermore, we're, we're uh, subject to a bunch of different constraints now, right? We've talked about all these different constraints. So if a minimum value of z or a maximum value of z exists, then it can be found like this. We're going to graph the system of inequalities, representing all of the different constraints. We're going to find the value of the objective function at each corner or vertex of the graphed region. Okay? It'll either be a box or it'll be you know, a region. But we're looking at corners. And the maximum momentum has to occur at one of those points. So once we've got that, those points, we can test those points in the objective function and see which one gives us the maximum or minimum. Okay, so let's see what we look at. Here's the problem all put together as one problem. Do what? In, well, yeah. So we manufacture bookshelves and desks. X is the bookshelves, Y is the desks. $25 per bookshelf, $55 per desk. Can't manufacture more than a total of 80. You had to have between 30 and 80 bookshelves and between 10 and 30 desks. So how many of each one do we need to manufacture to maximize our profit, and what is that maximum profit? These two values uh, should be able to be found just by plugging the corner points in, figure them out, and whichever one is the highest, that is the maximum daily profit. Okay? So here are our constraints x plus y less than or equal to 80, x has to be between 30 and 80, y has to be between 10 and 30. So let's graph that. First off, I only have to graph 
that first quadrant because I know that everything is going to be positive. Okay? So x plus y less than or equal to 80. I'm going to move my x over, right? Subtract x. I get y less than or equal to negative x plus 80. So that gives me 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. That gives me an intercept of 80 and a slope of negative 1. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. No problem with that. No? Okay. X has to be between 30 and 80. So that's X equals 30. That's X equals 80. Right? Okay. And then we've got Y has to be between 10 and 30. So that's 10, and that's 30. So now if we look at this, from our first equation, y had to be less than that line. So we're talking about y being less than, OK? Second equation has to be greater than 30 but less than 80. Greater than 30 but less than 80. And then the last one was between 10 and 30. So we're looking at the area constrained by all of these things. That's why it's called constraints, right? So where are the vertices for that? We've got one here, 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 and here. Okay? Now remember, this is not to scale, so... We're going to have to look at it a little closer to figure out where these points are. We know this point is 3010. So we've got 3010. This point is 3030. This point, well, I don't know where that is. So it is, it's, well, it's supposed to be, let's see, 30, 1, 2, 3, yeah, it's supposed to be 50, 30. Because remember, this will be 70-10 here. 70-10, 60, 20, 50, 30, 40, 40, 30, 50, 20, 60, 10, 70, 0, 80. So those are the four points on here. So if you use graph paper, which is always recommended when you do these kind of linear programming problems because you want to see where these points are, you'll see where the points are. So now, yes, sir. How does your I changed it into slope intercept form by subtracting x from both sides. Uh, and then it's got a slope, I mean, it's got an intercept of 80 and then a slope of negative 1. So now we're going to plug in these into our objective equation and see what we get. So if we put 30, 10, what's 30 times 25 plus 10 times 55? Fifty. 
1300 All right, what's 30 times 25 plus 30 times 55? It's going to be a bigger number. There are people with plenty of calculators, and you got Zach doing it in his head, giving me answers. We're going to trust him? 2,400. All right. What about 50 times 25 plus 30 times 55? Obviously going to be a bigger number. 2,900. And then what's 70 times 25 plus 10 times 55? Twenty three hundred. So which one gives us a maximum? Fifty thirty. So we need fifty bookcases, thirty desks, and we will generate twenty nine hundred dollars of maximum profit. That's the most money we can make per day. That's not too bad. So some people like these problems because it gives you a chance to draw pictures and use colored pencils. I like them because I, I use my colored pencils when I do these. So, But that's really all there is to linear programming. You graph all the constraints. Find the region that's bounded by all of your constraints and test the vertexes, the corners. Okay? Because you know they're all going to be in quadrant one because X and Y both have to be positive. end of linear programming. Like I said, it's not a challenging concept. It's just doing it, you know, making sure that you know how to uh, graph all those inequalities. Finding the corners is not difficult, particularly if you've graphed it on graph paper. And then plugging them back into your objective function, just algebra, OK? So that's 7, 6. Now. Now we got to do some math. Binomial theorem. No. But it's important to know. Because I'm telling y'all, when I hit the lottery, I'm going to walk down the streets and be like, I'm going to stop people and be like, what's the binomial coefficient? $1,000. And they're not going to be able to tell me, and I'm going to laugh and run away. <laughs> oh, no. No, I'll have, I'll, have, I'll have, like, some big dude with me. And like, don't, don't mess with me. He, he's got a gun. He's got a, you know, or concealed carry. It's under his, I don't care. Nobody's going to get my money, except for people that know math. All right? So we want to be able to evaluate a binomial coefficient. We want to expand a binomial raised to a power, and we want to find a particular term in a binomial expression. So what am I talking about when I talk about binomial? What's a binomial? Two, yeah, it's a, it's a polynomial with two terms. You know, polynomial means an expression with more than one term. A binomial means it has two terms. What's the one with three? What about four? That has no, we don't call them quadnomials, quintinomial. A sextinomial, no. Dodecanomial, you know, no. Okay. So binomial just means it's got two. So when we're talking about the coefficient of a binomial, we're talking about when you expand that binomial out, like if it's, for example, x plus y cubed. The coefficients of the binomial are when you expand that, when you multiply it out, and look at the coefficients in front of each term. That's what we're talking about. That's what a binomial coefficient is. Okay?
This is the definition of binomial coefficient. For non-negative integers n and r, with n always being greater than r, greater than or equal to r, then the expression n above r, that's how you say it, is called the binomial coefficient, and it's defined as n factorial divided by r factorial over n minus r factorial. No. N factorial over R factorial times N minus R factorial will give you $1,000. If you say N above R, I might give you like 20. <laughs> no, $20. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's factorial? Who here knows factorial? Who, who here has done factorials? Everybody done factorials? Most people, some people, anybody? Okay, so what does this mean? I'll give you a hint. It's not three. It's not factors. You want it to be. You, you, you know, you hear the word factorial, you're like, eh, it's got something to do with it, but it doesn't. All right. You just multiply this number times every integer less than it, every positive integer. So it's equal to three times two times one. Or six. So what's six equal to? Or six times five times four times three times two times one. Something like that. Hundred and forty four times five. Twenty zero two two two. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, 20 times 36, 720, yeah. It's amazing. You can do it depending on how you look at the problem. Because I did 3 times 2 is, or uh, 3 times 4 is 12, 6 times 2 is 12, 12 times 12 is 144, so 144 times 5. That's harder. Anyway. So, what is 6 above 3? Give me a number. That's not on the test. I'm not even bringing a paper and pencil with me today. <laughs> so it's going to be 6 factorial over 3 factorial, 6 minus 3 factorial, which is 6 factorial over 3 factorial, 3 factorial, which is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 factorial over 3 factorial 3 times 2 times 1. 3 factorials will cancel out. 3 will go into 6 twice. 2 will go into 2. 20. No. This 3 is 3 factorial. It canceled with this 3 factorial. If you wanted to, you could write it as, just write it completely out. And a lot of people do it that way. 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 over 3 times 2 times 1 times 3 times 2 times 1. Notice the 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1 will just cancel out. So then 2 will go into 4 twice, 3 will go into 6 twice, 2 times 5 is 10 times 2 is 20. When you're doing factorials, the easiest way to do it is to write out the top all the way down to the highest factorial you have on the bottom, so you can just cancel them. Like if you had 20 factorial over 16 factorial times 3 factorial, you know, something like this, or times 4. I should say. Then I would write that as 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times 16 factorial, and then say 16 factorial times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 
then I can cancel the 16 factorials out. I don't have to write them all out because they're just going to cancel out. Okay? What about 6 above o, uh, 0? Now, this is not 6 divided by 0. Uh huh. This is the problem. What is 0 factorial? Without that little tidbit of information, which we're assuming at this point since some of you know factorials that we've done them before, but that's, that is one of the basic rules of factorial, that 0 factorial is equal to 1. So what is 6 above 0? It's going to be 6 factorial over 0 factorial, 6 minus 0 factorial, which is 6 factorial over 0 factorial times 6 factorial. Just one. Anything above zero is one. Okay, so some rules. Hold on. They don't want to give them to you? I'm going to give them to you. Anything above zero is one. Anything above itself is 1. Okay? Why? Because n of 0 is n factorial over 0 factorial times n minus 0 factorial. That's just n factorials just cancel out, right? You just get 1. n above n is n factorial over n factorial times n minus n factorial. So you get these cancel out. This is just 0 factorial, which is 1. Okay? So those are two important things. So what's 8, 2? a bunch of calculators working and I don't know why. 8 factorial over 2 factorial times 8 minus 2 factorial is just 8 times 7 times 6 factorial over 2 times 1 times 6 factorial. 2 will go into 8 4 times, 4 times 7, 28. And then three above three. Thank you. It's like, come on, y'all. I just told y'all anything above itself is one. Now, I'm going to show you something. It's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see.
Okay. Has anybody ever seen this? This is called Pascal's Triangle. What Pascal's triangle gives you, magically enough, are the binomial coefficients. Now, the first row is the zeroth row. Okay? First spot is zero. And then they go to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay? So if I'm looking for 8, 2, I go to the 8th row, second spot. 8th row, that's this one that's got 8 in it. Second spot, this is 0, 1, 2. I don't know why 20, 21 plus 7 is 8. Now, it's 28, which is what we got before when we did it. Now how we do this is every number in here can be found by adding the numbers above it. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. 1 plus 4 is 5. 4 plus 6 is 10. 4 plus 6 is 10. 4 plus 1 is 5. 10 plus 10 is 20. 15 plus 20 is 35. 21 and 35 is 56. The numbers above it create the number below it. So if you forget the formula for the binomial theorem, you can always draw out Pascal's triangle and get your answer. The second one? 3, 3. Third row, 0, 1, 2, 3. Because what did I say? Anything above 0, always 1. Anything above itself, always one. Now what these represent, like I said, are if you take x plus y, say to the fourth power, then that's the same thing as saying x plus y squared times x plus y squared, right? x plus y squared is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. Same thing for this one. And then we multiply these out. x squared times x squared. x squared times 2xy. <coughs> mm -hmm. x squared times y squared. Then 2xy times x squared, two xy times two xy, and then two xy times y squared. Y squared times x squared, y squared times two xy and then y squared and y squared, no, y to the fourth. If we add these together, we get x to the fourth, 4x cubed y, 6x squared y squared, 4xy cubed, 1y to the fourth. What are those coefficients? 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. Fourth row of Pascal's triangle. That's why it's called the binomial coefficient, because these are the values that you're going to get any time you do it to the fourth power, that's fourth row. Do it to the eighth power, these are going to be the coefficients. Now, if you'll notice your variables, x is the fourth, starts at the fourth, cubed, squared to the first, none. They're descending by one. 
the Y's are ascending. None. One, two, three, four. Okay? So, notice that that's the pattern. So now that you know the pattern, if I were to ask you, let me do this. Keep that. Insert a new slide. Find me x plus y to the seventh power. Okay? Now, I know from this slide that the coefficients are 1, 7, 21, 35. 35, 21, 7, 1. So I know it's 1, 7, 21, 35, 35, 21, 7, 1. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You should have eight total coefficients. Now I know my x starts with the highest power, x to the 7. And then x decreases by 1 and y increases by 1. Next, x decreases, y increases. Next, x decreases, y increases. Next, same deal. And notice that the exponents should always add up to 7. 7. 6 and 1 is 7. 5 and 2 is 7. 4 and 3 is 7. 3 and 4 is 7. 2 and 5 is 7. 6 and 1 is 7 is 7. Then you just drop in your coefficients. 1, 7, 21, 35, 35, 21, 7, and 1. And that's it. That's binomial expansion. It becomes a little more difficult when you change the x and y to something like 2x minus 3 to the fifth power. Then all I do is I change the x into 2x and the y into negative 3. Okay? So, this is going to be 2x to the 5th plus 2x to the 4th, negative 3 to the 1, plus 2x cubed, negative 3 squared, plus 2x squared, negative 3 cubed plus 2x negative 3 to the fourth plus negative 3 to the fifth. Okay, do you see how all I did was change 2x into x and negative 3 into y? The pattern is exactly the same. So what's 2 to the fifth power? 32? So this is going to give me 32x to the 5th, 2 to the 4th, times negative 3, negative 48. So minus 48x to the 4th, and then negative 3 squared is 9, 2 cubed is 8, so 72x cubed, negative 3 cubed, negative 27, 2 squared is 4, so negative 108 x squared, negative 3 to the fourth power, positive 81, times 2, so that's going to be plus 162x and the negative 3 to the fifth power 
243, negative. Okay, now, the only problem is we haven't put the binomial coefficients in yet. So we have to go back to our fifth row of Pascal's triangle and say, what are the coefficients? So I've got times one, times five, what's the next one? Times 10, times 10, times five. Now, Yeah, times one. No, it's right. Yeah. These are the fifth row of Pascal's triangle. Fifth row. One, five, ten, ten, five, one. Why are we using that? Because it's the fifth power. This is a different problem. Yeah, this this is a different problem from from that one. So now this gives us 32 times 1 is 32x to the fifth. Negative 48 times 5. Negative 240x to the fourth. And then plus 720x cubed. Minus 1080x squared. Plus 0, 1, 8, 10x minus 243. That's the final. Instead of actually doing 2x minus 3 times 2x minus 3, getting a trinomial, multiplying it by 2x minus 3 again, getting a four-nomial, multiplying it by 2x minus 3, getting a five-nomial, which could be really long, drawn out. Well, it's not... This is long and drawn out too, but it's long and drawn out in a much easier way to me. Okay? Now remember, I'm not testing you on this. I just want you to be exposed to it because I think this is really fascinating and a really quick way to do binomial expansion. Does it make sense? A vague amount anyway? Yeah? That dude was smart. He was real smart. They had no internet, you know, no game systems, you know. That was pre-Nintendo, pre-Atari. There was a story about, I can't remember who it was. It was one of the most famous mathematicians. Uh, but he's the one that discovered that, I don't know if you've ever seen Anybody in here done summations? You know, where you use sigma? Where i equals 1 to n of like 2i plus 3, something like that. This is called sigma notation, where you're summing a bunch of things together. Anyway, there's a formula for the sum of the first i integers. If you just add numbers together, you, there's a formula for, if you go to 10, I should, you should be able to tell me what that number is. There's a kid, I mean, he's like elementary school. The teacher, as an exercise in giving y'all busy work while I go chill out and do whatever I want to do, told her students, you know, add the first 100 numbers together. And he's like, all right, here it is. And do you know who it was? What's the answer? Do you know why? Yes, because every point along the line has a counterpoint that equals 150 times. That's what 50 This is, he did it, yeah, he, I think he did it kind of that way. Where if you look at the numbers, right, you've got 1 plus 99, that's 100. 2 plus 98, that's 100. 3 plus 97, that's 100. You've got 50 pairs that do that, you know. You know, plus, you know, so that's that's the way you come up with that number. But there's a formula for it, and it is n times n plus one divided by two. If I tell you to add the first hundred digits, hundred plus one hundred one divided by two.
Fitty, fitty. A hundred times 101. Or 50 times 101. Okay? So if I were to ask you, what's the, if you add up the first 20 numbers, what is it? Twenty. So you do twenty times twenty-one divided by two, or ten times twenty-one to ten. You had your one in the wrong place. And you can verify that just by adding them: one plus two plus three plus. Eight. It's going to be two ten. It works for any two numbers or any number. If you're adding all the digits up to a certain number, that's how you find it. There's also a way to figure out the sum of all squares. Some of all cubes, you know. So, and they were found by smarter people than me. So here is that formula that we just did. Do what? What number? What letter? Sigma. It is the sum of all of the binomial coefficients from zero to n of a to the n minus r, b to the r. Now, we don't know sigma notation, so this means squat at this point. So don't just kind of ignore that. What we're saying is the first binomial coefficient times a to the n. That's whatever this number was, right? So that's what we did, x to the seventh, x to the fifth, whatever. Then n goes down by one, goes down by two. It's decreasing. b, no b, has one. Then it's got two, then it's got three, and it's increasing all the way to n, which is whatever this is. Okay? So it's the same formula I did, it's just written in math speak, which means it's like more complicated. So I don't we don't have to do it because I've already done it. But and they don't use Pascal's triangle, they actually do binomial coefficients, which is all good when you're doing like 43 above 22. Yeah, use binomial coefficient for that. Use the formula. But if it's the first 10 and you're multiplying something out, just go ahead and draw out Pascal's triangle just because it's quicker. Okay? Now, what if I wanted to find a specific value? Find the fifth term in this expansion. So the fifth term is which term on Pascal's triangle? The first one is the zero. So it's actually the four, right? Because zero, one, two, three, four would be the fifth term. Okay? So you're looking for nine, four, and then the 2x and the y. Now, when you're talking about the fifth term, your first term was x to the 9, then you got x to the 8, y1, x to the 7, y2. So notice that in the first term, second term, third term, you can always tell which one is going to be bigger, right? If you're on the front end, x is always bigger. If you're on the back end, y is always bigger. Uh, they're always going to add up to 9. And the depending on which term you're at, x will be, let's see the easiest way to say this. It'll be n minus, it'll be n minus the place. Like, so, since I'm 4, right, that I'm looking at the fourth place. I'm looking at uh, n minus 4 or 9 minus 4. So I'm looking for when x, x is 5. So that's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth term. OK? 
okay? So if x to the fifth, y to the fourth, then I take x, which is 2x to the fifth, and then y to the fourth. So what's 2 to the fifth power? 32, x to the fifth, y to the fourth. And then I multiply it times the, the fourth or the fifth term or the fourth 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in Pascal's triangle, the ninth row, which if I haven't drawn it out yet, if I do this, it may be easier just to go ahead and use the binomial coefficient formula. Do 9 factorial over 4 factorial, 5 factorial. So it's going to be 7 times 9 is 63, 126. So then I'm going to multiply this by 126. So what's 126 times 32? Four thousand thirty-two. So that should be the fifth term in that expansion. Okay? Forty thirty two x to the fifth, what of the fourth? All right. That's binomial expansion. To me, the two things that we just did are probably the funnest thing that I do in this class. <laughs> but I really like binomial expansion because it's practical to me. Because I've done so much having to multiply things out in my career that it was really effective for me to learn that. Uh, if you don't have to do a lot of that in your you know, field of study,